I told you I was going to give you three new ways to think about leadership and what really effective, extraordinary leaders do. And in order to create that, the first thing that I have to do is give you a tiny setup that really belongs in my inevitable you coaching system. And this is the first slide that most believe that the mind is, is this mystery place. You know, what, what's going on in that mystery place? It's intangible uh, and often just hard to understand, hard to function. And in a crisis, oh my goodness, you know, what, what people think, what they do, how they behave. It becomes very difficult for most people. And as a consequence, this is important for you as a leader, as you look at your leadership models, how you show up at work, at home, when you are leading. You believe, many of you believe that this is what's happening, but what if, what if behavior, motivation, people were precisely logical, not logical, not irrational, but very precise, very easy to understand, and very rules-based, and in a crisis, in a crisis, then what you find out is they become even more, even more so that you can follow why people do what they do. Now, when you say, well, Bill, how does I, I've been around people. I've been around people in a crisis. How does that happen? Here's what takes place. That there's these complicated equations that are running. And when these equations run, do you agree that, in essence, we, we are constantly balancing them when they're unbalanced? And then we really have a need to unbalance them at times when they're balanced. So when you're on your way to great success, you might sabotage yourself or you're on your way to do something and you procrastinate. You will unbalance, and not to your favor, by the way, you will unbalance equations. But what that means is in this series of as I think about my life, I think about my reality, can I? No, 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 I can't. Well, I have hope now uh, well, no, there's there's more fear running uh, because uh, there's there's risk versus reward, and and I'm going to look at the balance and the tipping points of those equations, and I'm thinking, will I, won't I, when, when will I? Well, now, no, not now. I won't I won't do it now because it's fair. It, it, it's not fair. I I understand the game. No, I don't. And and so many more equations. Yeah, this does look complex, but the reality is if we look at the output of these equations, what in, hap what in actuality happens, we decide to take action. We're going to do something, or, or not. Most people's decisions many times are no decisions at all, so their action is, no, I'm not going to do anything yet. I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. And that becomes an action. They choose to dream that they can. They have hope. They have, they have moving dreams or not. Maybe their dreams are, are nightmares and they're worried about how it will turn out. They assign, we assign meanings. They, we assign motions. Once we know what it means, we know what emotion to assign. And therefore, the strategies that we take that string the actions together, that we procrastinate or, or prepare, that, that we do it now or, or we wait, or what's the standard? Maybe when you turn in a project management report or your, your pipeline or whatever business, you know, maybe you're used to getting, you know, we're going to call it a B or, or maybe a B plus. Well, if all of a sudden you, you put in an A effort, well, gosh, the equation is the boss is going to expect me to do that every time. And I don't want to have that responsibility or that expectation. So the standards by which these equations are playing out, where you make compromises, there's so many things that go into this. So people go back to this and they go, oh, yeah, this is the complication. That's who we are. But let me ask you a question, and this is much of what my coaching system is built on. Just like if we were to look at Windows 8 and look at what's the code behind it, none of us are programmers, none of us can read the code behind it, but we're certainly an expert 
We know how to print. We know what a shortcut looks like. We know how to input data. We'll look at these equations and we'll say, they're hard, I don't understand, but we know the input-output cycle. So if you as a leader tonight changed it how you're looking at things, now here's what I want to ask you. We're going to map what we understand about human behavior to leadership. And what most leaders or managers or tipping points, and that could be a whole debate in and of itself, what's the difference what's the similarities, what makes someone a leader versus a manager in a crisis or not in a normal day-to-day, -day. when do extraordinary leaders want to be good managers, but that's that's not not what we're about tonight. You know, you think that you are in charge of, you're going to call them somewhat predictable, as long as it's, uh, you know, in flow and moving, no crises, the economy hasn't cratered, government regulations hasn't taken out my product line, something hasn't happened, we, it's pretty predictable, but, but it's somewhat irrational. I'm in charge of, of doing something. I've got to do something. So the how I go about doing that, you might follow a, a rational set of equations, and we call that, you know, you are an IQ-centric in that moment. If you're following emotions, or inspiration, or in people's hearts and passions, we would call you an EQ-centric leader, but, but it's following some rational, some predictability, some logic to it. You might follow the golden rule. The golden rule says, you know, that we do unto others as we would have done unto us. And so we think back to when we were first being led, or even the bosses that we have today, even if we're a senior leader on this call, the bosses that we have today, what we like, what we don't like. We do what we like. We do how those leaders treat us. And, and on one hand, we don't do what we dislike. So we're following the golden rule in part. Force versus power. There's a great book by a brilliant scientist, a guy named Dr. David Hawkins. And his book is actually Power Versus Force. I've reversed it here because, in essence, he talks about the psychology and the neurology and the mental software that do we force things to happen or because we show up as a leader and we have innate power, do we power things to happen? But in this, am I going to force my team to do this through threats, intimidation, through rewards, through wheedling and cajoling, you know, how am, I, how am I creating momentum for my team? Maybe we think, oh, you know, ah, that person, oh, he's, he's born to do this, she's born to do, do this. So we say, oh, there's these innate traits. And then even when you think about it, you go, well, learning, yeah, you, you, you can learn some about being a leader, but an extraordinary leader, extraordinary, how would I do that? And then in a crisis, in a big crisis, the boss is, the business is, clients is, a lot of these leadership principles go out the window. We all fall back to older psychology systems, older defense systems, etc. So we put this leadership into motion, but there's a much deeper truth here that we're going to cover tonight. Extraordinary leaders, whether they're born in May or made, and either way, and I'm going to challenge anyone who wants to, to, to talk about this tonight or type Brian any questions because your mics are muted. It's equally effective if you're born to this or you learn this. Equally effective, regardless of what you've been told. If you follow certain psychologies, and that's the point of what we're trying to do tonight, and I'm going to do three simple viewpoints for you. Now, I could have started off with kind of what we call Leadership 101, that you know, we'll talk about how leaders are extraordinary, visionary women and men that can see months and years into the future and very clearly create. We, we could talk about what great communicators they are. We, we could talk about how they care 
at extreme depths and intensity compared to managers who worry more about spreadsheet and numbers perhaps leaders worry about people and 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 human capital but we're not doing that tonight that's for another time and place I want to go into this work that I do in the mental software into the neuroscience view and there are three things I want to talk about number one people are not people they're code and do you see them as their equations or do they do you say they are and 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 describe it they are lazy they are energetic they they can because they are they do do you see them as a they or do you really just like when you're dealing with children and you say oh little Billy I'm not going to punish you for who you are I'm punishing you for what you did we have places in our lives that we know that people are separate from their actions people are separate from their thoughts if you think of it this way and if you see them as code and now you can look at this and say what program what code ran that sentence and now go back to these equations that I talked about and and the equations are saying I can I can I will I won't I should but not hope will they're running equations and when you look at can I ascertain rather than trying to figure out again when we just look at Windows 7 we want to look at data that we put into it the report is due by this deadline it, the you have to close this business by this deadline the business has to create this project outcome under budget or on budget by this deadline rather than try and dig into the equations leave that for an expert like me look at it as to what program can I can I do that what what if I did what would I say what would I do to balance or unbalance their equation so for instance a great software equation I had a professional athlete that came in to see me and when I did his assessment I asked him what sentence what big sentence between you and your dad and he was still close to his dad makes and creates your success he goes oh it's really easy I heard it all the time it doesn't matter how strong or fast you are what matters is how hard you work and most people look at that and go okay that's pretty straightforward I get that that's that's easy to understand when I ask this in a seminar most people will say oh that's a great sentence doesn't matter how strong or fast you are matters how hard you work but if you were to stop this sentence in the middle and ask yourself as a leader what child would you ever say to them it doesn't matter how strong or fast you are doesn't matter and the answer is you wouldn't say that to a strong and fast child because it matters if you're strong and fast you would try and say well because you're really slow and weak you know being slow and weak doesn't matter now you put in the great sentence it matters how hard you work and people think they've got a great sentence this was why we have to know the program that's running it this sentence for this gentleman as a professional athlete retired into a new industry completely changed when he was told you are strong and fast and and there's a big and and it matters how hard you work but because he wasn't slow and weak in his chosen sport the first half of the equation didn't bother him but when he became active in a second career and as a celebrity he was expected to do well compared to people in a cerebral scientific based business model he wasn't strong and fast now this equation kicked in we have to know and look at people as the code look at what program is running their sentences is it a program born of hope born of desperation is it a program born of turning lemonade or is it a program that has a trigger point that says well I can create lemonade till about the 92 percentile and then all bets are off and when you begin to look at this differently and separate people from their strategies 
and then just define the strategy. Ask questions about their strategies and, and, and try and understand the choices, not who they are because they are not. A computer is not XP. It runs XP. It's not Vista. It runs Vista. It's not Windows 7. It's running Windows 7. So when we look at people and their programs, number one, when you begin to look at this, I want you to spend a lot of time at the fact that people are code, they're equations, they are logic driven. You just have to know what their tipping points are. When do they go from I can't do this to I can? It might be when their child is threatened. You can sit there and say, I need $10,000 to do this. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Then all of a sudden your child gets sick. They need $10,000 for a surgery. Oh, you find a way to create the money. You got to look at the tipping point. You got to look at the drivers. When you understand this at a programmatical level, and there's 277 tools, specific tools in my toolbox, we just looked at one, which is subconscious command structures. I can look at any paragraph. You can look at any paragraph. And somebody says, well, I was late with this report because one, blah, 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 two, blah, 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 three. Don't listen to the data. Look at the software. Look at the equation. Understand and see them as code you're going to have a much different outcome. Second thing I want to talk to you about what effective extraordinary leaders do is the tool is called the quantum reframe. And here's the setup. Here's what it is. We all know the answer to the question if I were to say is this glass half full or half empty? Some of you would say half full. Some of you would say half empty. Some of you, it's half empty, but you know you're supposed to say half full, blah, blah, blah. The reality is the glass is always both. And the reality is it's really a trick question because you're not asking anything at all about the glass. In order, and this is, again, this is the code. This is why the first tool builds to the second and will build to the third. It's a trick question because what we're really asking is, what or who are you when you are looking at the glass? Because if the glass is always both, when you are half full, you will see the glass that way. When you are half empty, you will see it that way. So your ability to do this science we call reframing. You know, I had a woman stand up in a seminar who said to me, oh, yeah, I get it. It's really great. You can reframe anything. Wow, that's really cool. Let me ask you a question. I'm going through this horrible divorce. I've spent every penny I've got. How am I going to reframe that to a positive? The glass is half full. Well, remember, the storms of life are always the storms. We're going to talk about that in a moment. They're real. They're there. But think about this. I said, look, and she had lost custody. She, she had barely had visitation rights. Her daughter was 13 years old. I said, look, let me ask you a question. First of all, I want you to create a memory box. And a memory box, because kids at 12, 13, age 6, they can be bitter. They don't understand the fights. They want to know why the, the mom or the dad that's not seeing them, why? Well, in the memory box, you're going to put a ton of memories. You're going to be at Chipotle's, and you're going to write on the menu, man, I'm thinking about you. It's a sunny day. It would be a better day if you were with me. They're going to be watching a TV show. They're going to be at a movie. They're going to write on a sticky note. Just drove by the corner where you used to, blah, blah, blah. Put a ton of things in the memory box. Now, when you go and talk to that child whenever you get a chance, maybe when she's 16, she has more autonomy, maybe when she's 18, there will be a day she comes and talks to you and you tell her, not only do I want you to see this box because you know how I feel about you, I spent every penny I had fighting for you. I spent every penny. That's how much I loved you. You may not be able to change it in the moment. Yes, that's pain. I get that. But as a leader, to have the ability to tell your people, 
to communicate with your team, to inspire them to see the other side of the glass and, and have it be real. It's got to be real. It's got to be authentic when you do this. There's so much power in your ability to reframe. It is not fake it till you make it. I am not a fan on faking it till you make it. Here's why. For instance, if your checkbook is a big fat zero and you're going to go, oh, I'm going to fake it, and you're going to go, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm, I'm wealthy, I'm rich, and then hopefully someday you're going to have money till you make it. Here's the problem. On day one when you do this, not only is your checkbook still zero, in essence you're programming your mind, your code, that you're a big fat liar too. But if you reframe this to say, I am, and it's nothing to do with your wallet, it's got to be authentic for you, I am rich in spirit, I am ready for money, I am committed to my wealth, I am a man or woman who has incredible resourcefulness, getting more resourceful every day, I'm changing the script. The script that I cannot, I'm poor, it won't, it will never. And when you're a leader leading people to reframe this, there is so much greatness and power in finding the authentic script. We are ready for the solution. If you're having any problem with this, type a great question into Brian and say, well, I'm not buying it because I can't reframe this. That's where you're going to get a lot of learning. Now, you do have to worry at some level, when is a reframe just a rationalization? It's a very important question. When am I reframing and just pretending positive or blowing smoke up someone's skirt just to pretend positive? It's going to be based on your intention. Are you doing it for them? Are you doing it to cover you and hide your ego? That's going to tend to make it just a bold face rationalization. Sometimes, as we know, history is written by the victor. So sometimes the reframe versus rationalization is defined by the win, is defined by the victor. If you win, someone else, your boss, your spouse, someone you care about, could be beating the crap out of you going, I think you're just rationalizing why you haven't done this yet or why you can't do this yet. Or, oh my goodness, my favorite. You know, it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. That's why it's just a rationalization to pretend that you could do that. Yeah, I want you, if you ever want to have fun, it's one minute. Go YouTube the video, Think Different. It's a one-minute commercial. And watch that. Every one of those men and women are not in that commercial because they're more talented, more skilled, greater than other men and women. They do it because they're software, because they're code, because how they look at life is unrealistic and they made it happen. So when you're in this space of is it a rationalization? You will discover so much instant power and potentiality. When is a reframe a rationalization or a pipe dream? Again, it's written by the victor. I, and again, I want this stuff to be real. So I generally give a couple examples. Van Gogh, you know, he died penniless. He was ahead of his time. He painted Hundreds of years later, his stuff goes for millions of dollars. It didn't go for money and wealth when he was then. So it is what was he a pipe dream painter? Or was it uh, was he passionate and a believer? I talk about the Polish sculptor who is carving, was carving Crazy Horse Mountain. It is crazy what that man did. He started in the 30s with a wheelbarrow and a dynamite box because he thought a Native American should be immortalized along with the four faces on Mount Rushmore. He passed away. The mountain's not done. Was it a pipe dream what he was doing? 
Well, he's got six of 12 children work on the mountain today and probably 30 years after he's dead. So when you're looking at, you have to look at what is your heart, what is your soul saying, what is your passion saying, why are you doing it? Are you service driven? Are you ego driven? There's a set of questions you can ask. Sometimes they're the same cloth. That's why the quantum glass is so important. Because on one side we see reframe, and on one side we see rationalization. No, 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 no. Let's reverse them. They're the other way. Well, I'm a pessimist. No, I'm an optimist. This is how I, as a leader, is it unrealistic to convince my team I can, I should, we ought to. We can, we are. It's a pipe dream. We're going to tilt against Goliath. We're David. Well, we know all the time underdogs make it to the top, and we see all the time that superheroes with every superpower don't make it, don't win. What's the intangible? The intangible lies in the driver. It lies in these software moments. So the quantum tool, thank you, Don, for a great question. Yeah, and they didn't see their dreams realized in their lives. The question to ask is, was it pipe dreams? They both launched incredible value. They both launched amazing things to the planet. What kind of leader are you going to choose to be? Are you going to say, no, it's unrealistic, it's a pipe dream to, to, to do this business model, to launch this company? Would you have felt better if Van Gogh was just a billboard painter and made some money? Would you feel better if, if this Polish guy didn't carve the mountain because he couldn't get it done in his lifetime? Martin Luther King, one of my biggest tools, I have a dream. He knew in his lifetime he would not see the end of racism. He knew in his children's lifetime he didn't believe. Read his autobiography. But he believed that the only way he could do I have a dream and be authentic and legitimate is so that his grandchildren could see a world where they're judged on the content of their character and not the color of their skin. He had to be that man. Was Martin Luther King a pipe dreamer? Because he didn't see it ended, and he's dead too. The reason why I bring up these examples is because in one section of my work, I teach there's only three outcomes when you begin to dream and drive and become a leader of inspiration. You get it? And sometimes it's not in the right time frame. The time is off. But generally, that's because it ends up being better than you thought it would be. Because there's been no more time put to it. You die. You don't get there. The majority of people quit or compromise or stop their dreams. So if you're going to be an inspiring leader and keep people focused on the get, keep people focused on the dream, yeah, I don't mind pipe dreamers and unrealistic people coming into my office and saying, how do I get this done? Because those are the ones, and again, I want you to go back and look at that commercial. Those are the men and women, the pipe dreamers. They are the ones, and when you look at it, there's Edison, there's Buckminster Fuller, there's Amelia Earhart, there's Ted Turner, there's... Um, Audrey Hepburn, there's a number of, they got their dreams in their lifetime. Some of them are still living. This question for people on the call to say, am I a pipe dreamer? Am I going to push? Am I going to be an extraordinary leader? Remember, I said you're going to get three tools that effective extraordinary leaders use. One of them is in this arena that I choose to be a leader who dreams unrealistic and believes in pipe dreams. And one of the ways they do that is they have the ability to reframe obstacles and challenges as lessons and experience en route to their success. Let's look at the quantum tool because as I started to say, I, as to my knowledge, I'm one of the few people that's actually teaching this. And here's what the quantum tool is. In this bimodal, bipolar world that I just said, where I said, you know, oh, the glass is half full, the glass is half empty, we tend to see things blo broken up into 
one versus the other. I did it on this sheet of paper right here. I said, here's the bimodal distribution. Can, can't, will, won't. Now, not now. Understand, don't get it. But the reality is, and this is what extraordinary leaders get, there is not two quadrants bipolar positions. There is actually four. This, if you get this and begin to work and practice on this, this is an enormous game changer. Here's what you get. If this is the half full and this is the half empty, you also have a half empty of the half full, meaning you got too much of a good thing, and you also have half full of the half empty, which means there is good in bad. There is positive in the negative. So in a mere world where average leaders say we can, we cannot, it's good, it's, it's bad, it's light, it's dark, there's actually a, there's another quadrant in operation here. The words we assess when it's too much, too good of a good thing, we think saying things like gluttony. We say things like hedonism. We say things like over moderation. That's what fills this quadrant. They're good, but it's too much. It becomes destructive in its size, volume, and intensity. On the other hand, while evil is evil and dark is dark, when it's on the positive side. You think, well, there's nothing positive about negative. Well, of course there is. We say things like Mae West. Ooh, naughty. Naughty's good for us. Ornery. Oh, little Billy, he's just really ornery. You know, this this organization, oh gosh, they just, they just, they're the practical jokers. They're always doing bad things, but they're so good for the team. And here's the truth, and this is why when you really begin to look at this as code and you look at this as different, what you will discover is very rarely does anybody operate in all four quadrants. What happens is where you say that you know the difference between right and wrong, the difference between a good choice and a bad choice, and then you make what appears to be a bad choice, it's because there is the third quadrant. It will never be the other quadrant. It might look like that. It might have another appearance. This equation and issue might be there. So this one isn't on that. You will have, in general, three of the four quadrants in play. Should I or should I not? And then what you call the gray area will lie in what is known as the second and third quadrant. This is a game-changing tool for a free webinar and a fun night. I've got white papers on this. I've got podcasts on this. I've got YouTube videos on this. I'm going to teach a course here in April on this in great detail. We put procrastination up here. We put you know, uh, motivation up here. You begin to look at things in four quadrants. Enormous things begin to happen. And then the last thing that I want to cover tonight, because I'm very, very mindful, as I begin to do more and more of these free webinars, know that I will always start on time, and I will always finish on or before time. I will get you out of here. This is the third thing, and this is a really tough sentence. Extraordinary leaders own the weather. They are responsible for everything that happens or fails to happen. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, what happens is most people, when they're given a mission, all right, I want you to launch this product. I want you to roll out this project plan, have this built, have this done. People will begin to say, okay, I can do that. I got that. That's pretty good. But, oh, here comes the problems. Here comes the, the limitations. Oh, my gosh, one of the limitations is it's just storms. It's bad. You know what? The economy. That's bad. It's a bad economy now. Oh, our, our competition. They're undercutting the prices. The, there is factors that are out of my control. I cannot control the outcome. I can't. I can't means I don't have the ability. What we learned in the military, one of the reasons why we have an elite 
military, the best in the whole world, is because it doesn't matter what the weather is. It doesn't matter. You have to get the mission done and you have to bring everybody home. That's that's the only. Now, sometimes you don't get the mission done. Sometimes everybody doesn't make it home the way you want. Maybe they're injured. Maybe they're not here anymore. But when the mindset, when you approach your mission, you will win more often and you will bring more people home alive. You'll get more things done. This is what allows you to be unrealistic. Because now if you own the weather in your leadership model, you will show up with a plan if the weather turns bad. Because the weather does turn bad. Economy goes down. Government regulations change. Our competition launches a, a, a new evo evolution of a product that's just beating us hands down. Extraordinary leaders do not blame. They don't make excuses. They don't say, I'm helpless. If you ever hear this expression, drives me crazy. Well, we did the best we could. Extraordinary leaders never say that. Not as a reason, not as a cause. It might be an effect, it might be an acknowledgement in the locker room. After the Broncos get skunked, Peyton Manning says, yes, gentlemen, we did the best we could. But he went into the owning everything, and oh, gee, he didn't own the crowd noise. Didn't expect it, never seen a Super Bowl that loud. I actually have a client in the Broncos locker room, not a player, just in the locker room. He was at the game, obviously, the noise. He said when, when Peyton went to take that snap, he said, you could not imagine. He goes, I've played in home stadiums that weren't this noisy. But you have to as a leader, if you approach the problem statement, if you approach the truth, the I own this mission, soup to nuts, I'm bringing everything home, and I, I will do it on time. It's going to get done. It's on my watch. I've got the flank of the business and the organization. I'm going to do this. You will fail, and the more extraordinary you are, you actually fail more because you're asking for bigger things. You push people harder. In the military, in elite military operations, we are not looking for unbreakable soldiers. Everybody breaks, both in training and in real life. We break. That's not what we look for. We look for people who can get up. We look for people that don't quit. When you are this extraordinary of a leader and when you fall, you're not passing the buck. Well, marketing didn't do. Engineering didn't do. Well, it's just the weather. Hey, I did the best I could. Extraordinary leaders. And you really need to look at, now begin to go back and look what we built tonight. Look at your equations. Look at what you own. Look at what you believe. Look at how you're mapping leadership today in your business model. And men and women under you that you are inspiring or creating limitations to lead. Go into a deeper place. Know that this is a function of how you think, not any other reality. It's not talent. Talented people fail all the time. Untalented people win all the time. It's correlation. It is not cause and effect. Are you going to own this? Are you going to see people as their strategies and operate and understand what is going on strategically within how they think and feel and focus? Or are you going to say, oh, people are lazy, people are, they don't do? Or are you going to go, the strategies that we're employing, because if you understand this is software, if you understand that people are running software, and if they were born in 1956, that software is installed by 61. They are running Windows 61. And Windows 61, with all its upgrades, might be 
above average. It might be better than other, it might be better than some people running Windows 85, but it is always going to be Windows 61 installed by a father who was running Windows 31 because that's when he was installed. And when we study extraordinary leaders, they are running an operating system and strategies and the thoughts and sentences that are coming out of their consciousness. It's driven by software. It's not driven by who they are. And if you change software, which only takes 15, 20 minutes, it's not I have to lay on a therapy couch and worry about, worry about, think about. And so to really help you guys very quickly, I have just launched, I've been doing this for four years, at a six day I tightened it to three days. The inevitable leader turning effective managers into extraordinary leaders. And day one, we're going to go into the book, the second book that I wrote. And it's the system. We, we baseline your software. The table for three really sets the Windows 61, old you, think, feel, fear, focus on, hope, dream, not. We look at new you, which is Windows 14, and the greatest version of you, which when we look at the top 1% of the planet, they're running Windows 2020. We look at how they transition. We've got two amazing design and build tools, and we're doing all of this within a leadership content, context on day two. We're doing all advanced tools out of the latest in neural sciences. I teach neural linguistic programming. We're going to look at neural communication sets. It's all advanced tools. Day three is case studies. Now, this course goes beyond because you get ongoing support. You get lead-ins into the Six-Day Leadership Academy 1 and 2. I have created a community of leaders. They think differently. They create differently. They support one another. You can join. The course is only $1,500 for the three days and for all of the ongoing support. It is beginning on April 8th through the 10th. If you bring five or more, kind of covered up there, we'll erase that. It discounts down to 1000 and if you buy now, by the end of this weekend, I'm going to give you a 72-hour from Thursday night. You're going to get a complimentary seat on day one, which means if you want to come in May 28th, then you can send somebody on April 8th free to day one. And they're going to get everything that we just talked about along with the book completely laid out. And if you come 8 to 10, you can come back on May 28th and do a whole refresher course on day one. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you found these tools and content of value and effective. Then I want to thank you. I appreciate your time tonight. If you want to talk to me offline, that's okay. I wouldn't put hair on me because I don't have hair. Thank you very much. Everybody have an in inevitable evening, and I hope your team in your March Madness bracket does everything unrealistically and awesomely well for you tonight. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you.